Climate change, we have a limited amount of time to resolve it. And it concerns everyone, literally everyone. How could we stay under two degrees C? Everybody has to do everything possible. China is now wanting to, on an equal footing with the U.S., able to influence the negotiation. China and the U.S. alone account for about 40% of global CO2 emissions. If you don't take the action, nothing happens. The window is closing, but our window is still open. How is China? I actually found the trip quite encouraging. I think, um, yay. <laughs> <laughs> so while I was there, I talked to some experts at mm -hmm. uh, Peking University and as well as um, some students about basically what the Chinese like attitudes were on climate change, the public awareness, understanding, policy. So I had some pretty good conversations while I was in Beijing. Climate change becomes such a huge issue inside China. Almost all major universities have the climate change projects, policy, technology, all this debate. Now more and more people realize the issue is a serious issue about solving the environment. That is a huge power. I went to China in 2009 prior to the Copenhagen Conference on a speaking tour that was sponsored by the State Department where I was talking about the importance of China doing something about to control their greenhouse gas emissions and I got pushed back everywhere I went. Then just a year later, I was invited to speak at a conference whose theme was, how should China control its greenhouse gas emissions with existing law or is new legislation needed? And I concluded that two things had happened in the intervening year. One is, the Chinese government was so stunned by the international criticism of its stance during the Copenhagen uh, COP uh, that they were unwilling to commit to control their emissions of greenhouse gases. And the second thing was, I think the Chinese have discovered that renewable energy and green technology is a real economic opportunity for them. Back in 2009, the U.S. and China were not working together, not nearly as closely as they are now. That's very important. That's a big difference. And, and sort of there's this recognition that China is key for the success of COP21 and, and thereafter. The issue is that the first is that uh, we have to be clear who has the responsibility, who make big contribution to the emissions. And the secondly is that who has the capacity to do so. So for the Chinese government, it's divided into uh, the different categories. We know that uh, uh, developed countries should take more responsibility. However, in the current process, China has a uh, large uh, emission of the pollution, and also China is the second largest uh, economy in the whole world. China has the capacity to address those kind of uh, uh, issues. China has never spoken of peak emissions uh, in their uh, formal negotiating positions up until the last, I guess, year and a half. And so that's a huge step forward. The agreement between China and the U.S. on climate that was announced last November really represented a sea change. So in China today, the central government is very committed to reducing their greenhouse gas emissions, and they're moving very aggressively towards alternative energy. China's INDC that came out June 30th basically formalized many of the measures that China signed up to in uh, November of the previous year. In addition, they have targets for increasing the share of non-fossil energy uh, in the primary energy mix to 20%. So this means a lot more solar, a lot more wind, and a lot more nuclear as well. China is already the largest user of wind, and developing solar technology is so much. So the green model is appearing here and there. In June, I was in Xinjiang province in far western China where they have wind farms that are so vast that it's like the distance between Baltimore and Washington. You can go for 30 miles and see nothing but these giant wind turbines and new ones being installed all the time. The main new contribution uh, in the INDC was to set a target uh, for CO2 intensity reduction. So this is basically um, the CO2 emissions associated with economic activity. That ratio will fall by 60 to 65 percent uh, between 2005 and 2030. And I think this, all of these taken together, uh, this is a pretty significant set of measures. Uh, it reflects to a large extent both the economic reality and the 
air pollution, the local domestic challenges that China is facing. China's economy is not growing as fast as it was during the period leading up to 2009. This new normal actually provides China opportunity. So new normal basically lower growth rate but higher quality of growth. Usually we enjoy growth rate of 10%, even 15%. But now people are comfortable with, let's say, 7% growth rate. And actually, it's, it's a blessing for people working in environmental protection. It's about the sustainable development of our society. So actually, it's labeled in our textbooks. So it's, it's been uh, advocated. Even advocated. Yeah, it's a basic national policy. To achieve the deep reductions that China has signed up to, there will be a need for uh, stronger climate policy instruments, including the cap and trade system, which they've just announced last week um, as part of a package of policies to really address domestically the need for incentives, strong incentives at the level of industry decision makers. I feel like in China, part of the reason they move so quickly is because the air, like you can see the air pollution. Yeah, it's so mean, clear. Is that or unclear? <laughs> but um, bump it. Like I was there for about two weeks, and there were I, don't, I think like half the time there was a blue sky, and it was like pretty exciting. Was it kind of just a happy accident that? Air pollution is caused mainly by coal, and coal is also yeah. the highest carbon emitter. As a singular issue, air pollution has really captured like everyone's attention. Our work shows that if you implement um, a carbon price consistent with a China's peaking in 2030 will also mean that the air quality situation doesn't worsen over the same period of time, mm -hmm. but it doesn't deliver the deep reductions needed to meet near-term air quality targets. So in addition to the carbon price, China will need to take additional measures. Thinking about all of these options in a coordinated way will be absolutely essential to ensuring that any effort to clean up the air doesn't undermine efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. From any textbook or from any documents, you would find China established a very comprehensive environmental regulatory system, and then followed by a word, however, enforcement, implementation is a, in question. I think the weakest link in China's environmental protection chain is local government. Central government makes policy. Local government is supposed to implement policy. Like, what's the relationship? Is it similar to the federal government and states in terms of yeah, the provinces? Yeah, they have the Chinese provinces, yeah. Uh, it's, it's but it's not, it's much more decentralized legally in China than it is in the United States. I read the U.S. environmental law cases. I see many states together suing another state or government. Um, this is really interesting. I, I, I can never imagine several provinces in China suing another province. But the National Development and Reform Commission is the most powerful government agency that gets to decide about major infrastructure projects. Yeah. And they're now under great pressure to move towards renewable energy. I think China's uh, position is quite clear. The first climate change is something that China really cares. The second is uh, to link the climate change and energy and air pollution and the water pollution is one of the way for China to deal with the long term of the sustainable development. And thirdly, I think that uh, China believes itself has to play uh, a very active role in the uh, global efforts to deal with not only climate change, but also other environmental uh, related uh, matters. So China's working with different UN agencies on sustainable development, and the concept of sustainability is very much in their uh, 13th five-year plan, which is going to cover the next um, five years of China's development. So, From 2015? Okay. Yeah, to, to okay. 2020. So, I mean, it sounds like they're going to be helpful at COP21, I mean, I mean, it sounds like they're on board. China is the largest emitter of the CO2, the U.S. second. So without these two countries commit uh, something uh, in 
Paris COP21, nothing could happen. So I feel optimistic. And so what is so with the, their INDC and the, they're putting a national cap and trade plan in place, what does that mean for Paris? China will do something remarkable if it implements its INDCs, it will have achieved a leveling off in CO2 emissions at a lower per capita income level than any other country, particularly compared to the US and Europe. And I think that sets a real example for other developing nations. Every COPS, China, Chinese government will come up with something new. Because of there's this internal progresses, technology, economic structure, all these policy changes in favor of a, a greener growth. We have uh, another fancy word that is global village. So now environment issues is really uh, global issues. So not any single country can do that on their own. Whether China can move to the right direction, not only important for China, has a lot of implications on the whole world, which direction of the world is going to move. So we have to work together. I think you will hear better news from China in the near future. Their contribution is, is, is very much achievable and it sets a great example for other countries ahead of Paris. I think China would actually love to lead in the clean tech area globally, not just at home.